Hello everyone and welcome to the lecture today. So today what we're going to be talking about is introducing some concepts from chapter 4 in the book, which is uh, divisibility and modular arithmetic, which we've in some sense already uh, kind of talked about on a, um, a re relatively uh, nice level uh, in terms of understanding, right? Uh, specifically, uh, we've talked about the equivalence class of um, integers modulo some positive integer m. Um, but it turns out that uh, this uh, set is a very rich set in terms of um, the, the mathematical ideas that it actually gives us and allows us to develop. Um, so we're going to talk about this for a while and then uh, we'll also go over uh, how to represent integers in uh, a general base and how to convert uh, from different bases, um, which is uh, super important in computer science where uh, typically uh, the most important bases are base 2, um, which is called binary, uh, base 8, which is called octal, um, base 10, which is decimal, this is what everyone's familiar with and how we typically write integers, and then the last one is base 16, which is called hexadecimal. But so let's uh, jump in and start uh, defining uh, some properties. And some of this is a little bit of review, um, specifically this first definition here, we have the divides relation. If A and B are integers with A non-zero, you say that A divides B if there exists an integer C such that B is equal to A times C. Equivalently, you could say that B divided by A is an integer. But um, uh, we like this definition right here because it only uses multiplication. And uh, it's relatively you know, straightforward to use um, instead of checking whether or not two uh, ratios are an integer or not. Um, when A divides B, we say that A is a factor of or a divisor of B and that B is a multiple of A. Um, this is just coming directly from uh, this uh, relationship right here. Um, just an important notation point, just for uh, our purposes, uh, we can say that A with a straight line that cross through it, B means that A does not divide B, or it's the negation of the statement A divides B, which means that uh, for any integer C, um, B is not equal to A times C. So we can go through uh, an example right now. We'll let n and d be positive integers, you could ask the question, how many positive integers not exceeding n are divisible by d and uh, what you can go through and see relatively easily is that um, um, if uh, you have some integer that is divisible by d, 
right? Uh, any integer that's divisible by, by d is of the form k times d for some k in the positive integers. Thus, uh, the number of positive integers divisible by d that do not exceed n equals the number of integers with k such that k times d is less than or equal to n. Which we know we can re-express as the number of k less than or equal to n over d. Where uh, n over d, right, uh, because d does not necessarily divide n, uh, this is in general going to be a, a rational number, uh, not uh, an integer. However, we can just use the floor function here um, because we know that uh, if n over d is a rational number, then there will at least be. K up to the floor function of n over d. Therefore, for all k in this set, um, k times d is an integer such that uh, it's k times d is divisible by d, and it's less than or equal to n. So the the the, the floor function here is giving us uh, the, the the this exactly this answer. So this is a very, very cool example and kind of uh, illustrates, you know, so the, one of the main types of theorems that we're going to be proving. Um, and it also shows a very important use of the floor function. But so uh, for the first theorem that we're going to show is that we'll just take three integers. We want to prove some properties of this divides relation. And the first property here is going to be if A divides B and A divides C, then A divides B plus C. The second property is if A divides B, then A divides B times C for all integers C and three if A divides B and B divides C then A divides C And the proofs of a one is in the book 
uh, in, in the book, proofs of two and three are left as exercises. Um, what I'll do right now is just go through the proof of two, uh, because I think the proof of one in the book is relatively straightforward. Um, the, the, the main idea here is the following. Uh, we rely strictly on the definition. We uh, assume that A divides B, which means that there exists some integer k in the set of integers such that b is equal to k times a, in which case um, we can multiply by any integer c to obtain the equality b times c is equal to k times a times c. And because integer multiplication is associative, this is the same thing as k times a times c. Therefore, a times c divides b times c. And we're done with the proof. The, uh, the proof of part three, again, also relies on uh, just the definition. I'm not going to go through it, but it'd be a good exercise for you to go through and try and prove for yourself, uh, just to kind of test that you're understanding this. Uh, the main thing is that you're proving an if-then statement, and you have to start by assuming A divides B and B divides C. Using uh, those two assumptions, then you show that A must also divide C. And we actually have an interesting corollary to this. That's that if A, B, and C are integers, where A is not equal to zero, such that A divides B and A divides C then A divides M times B plus N times C for all m and n that are integers, for all integers m and n. And uh, proof of this uh, really just comes from, you know, first applying uh, part two of the previous theorem, which is that uh, if a divides b, then m times a divides m times b, and also if a divides c, then n times a divides n times c. Um, and then adding those two things together, those two results together, and applying part one of the previous theorem will give us this result right here. Um, so this is a very straightforward uh, extension uh, that will be very, very important. So we have a very important uh, algorithm to define uh, that kind of helps us do this and is going to be very useful going forward. This is called the division algorithm. Let A be an integer, 
and d be a positive integer then there are unique integers q and r with r between 0 and d such that such that a is equal to q times d plus r. And we'll leave a proof of this uh, for uh, until a little bit later. Um, how, however, uh, the idea here is that this is very intuitive, right? You should go through and try and uh, do this for a number of different, uh, different integers until you feel kind of comfortable with what this is saying uh, in general. Typically we call R the remainder. So this is some integer that's less than the divisor D, uh, strictly less than the divisor, but positive. It's between uh, zero and it's strictly less than D. And we say it's the remainder of the division of A by D and Q we term the quotient in the division uh, of A by D. The proof of this is relatively straightforward and it actually uses uh, a property called the well-ordering property. Um, so I'll write that right here at the very top. is the big property that we're going to use and uh, turns out that you can show that the well ordering property is actually equivalent to the axiom of choice. It's one of the things that uh, sort of comes from the axiom of choice, uh, which is one of the reasons that it's so important. Um, but this is that every non-empty set of integers has a least element. And this is a very intuitive idea, but it uh, you know, is, has a direct um, justification uh, with our assumption of the axiom of choice in our, uh, our definitions of or our axioms for set theory. So the idea here is that we're going to use this property um, to go through and actually prove this statement. So if we let S be the set of integers, non-negative, of the form a minus dq where q is an integer um, the, the, the set is non-empty uh, because we can pick q to be anything so we can always pick q large enough so that uh, this negative d q right here This set is a non-empty set. It's non-empty because um, we can make Q as large uh, or as uh, negative as we want to. Um, so no matter the value of A, we can always choose a Q that makes uh, the combination A minus DQ positive. So this will always be non-empty, um, or we can always have this, you know, this is always gonna be a non-empty set. and. Uh, by the well-ordering property, uh, 
this set will have the least element. Uh, this least element, we'll call it R, which is equal to A minus D times Q naught. And uh, by definition, R is the, uh, an element in S, it's the least element in S. Um, so R is non negative. And uh, it's also the case that R is strictly less than D. If it uh, were not strictly less than D, then there would be a smaller non-negative element in the set S, which would give us a contradiction uh, to the uh, result that uh, R is the least element. And the idea here now is that because we have this, we then have that A is equal to Q naught times D plus R. And so we've shown by the well-ordering uh, property that uh, the existence of a quotient Q naught and the existence of uh, an R um, that satisfy the properties of the division algorithm. So this, this ends the proof. So we'll define some notation to sort of help us. In the uh, quality given by this division algorithm, um, D is the divisor I've, I've already used this and kind of talked about this a little earlier, but I want to really make a point of it. A is the dividend. Q is the quotient. And R is the remainder. when uh, dividing A by D. Furthermore, um, we have a very special notation that we use to denote these values. We say that Q, the quotient, is equal to A div D, to note that it's the, the, the integer that you get uh, as the quotient when you divide a by d and we write r as r or a mod d when uh, you express this division algorithm so a is equal to q times d plus r where r is between zero and strictly less than Z. Um, and what I want to note is that both a div d and a mod d for fixed d are functions on the set of integers. Um, furthermore, when a is an integer and d is a positive integer, uh, you actually have that a div d integer and D is a positive integer then a div D is equal to the floor function of the rational number a over D and also a mod D is just equal to a minus the floor function 
of a divided by d times d. And this is evidenced by if a is equal to q times d plus r, then r is equal to a minus q times d. And for uh, positive d uh, in any integer a, um, if q is the floor function of a divided by d, then um, this uh, equality is very, very clear. Now, uh, what I want to do now is kind of move into um, modular arithmetic, uh, which is um, you know very, very closely related to this idea of uh, divisibility. Uh, and we've already seen that um, the congruence relation is an equivalence relation on the set of integers. Um, so we'll review that right now. If a and b are both integers, and m is a positive integer, then a is congruent to b mod modulo m if m divides a minus b. And uh, we've already gone through and shown that this is, in fact, um, a uh, an equivalence relation on the set of integers, which is uh, essentially where modular arithmetic is, is coming from. Um, but uh, even without this equivalence relation, we can define modular arithmetic. Um, but uh, this understanding will uh, help us out uh, very, very much when we go through and um, you know write down the theorems that we're going to get uh, regarding uh, this equivalence relation in modular arithmetic. And again, I want to note our notation here. The notation A, three line B, and then in parentheses, mod M means A is congruent. to B modulo M. And I made a note of this before, but I want to really emphasize this, that um, in terms of modular arithmetic, right, you, know, you don't want to confuse this triple equal sign with the logical equivalence symbol that we've used before. Um, it just so happens that this triple equal sign is used very, very heavily in um, modern um, you know, modular arithmetic notation. And uh, we, uh, we're going to stick to that notation here uh, with the understanding that um, right, uh, from the context it's being used in, we can figure out what this triple equal sign means. Um, but uh, I also want to make a note that The notations A is congruent to B mod M and the notation A mod M is equal to B. Right? Both notations include mod m in them, or the mod in them, uh, but they represent fundamentally different concepts. Um, the congruence relation is a relation on the set of integers, uh, whereas the, the second notation, this a mod m equals b, represents a function, uh, specifically the, the, the function takes in as an input a, and calculates the remainder of the division of A by M, which gives you an output of B. So um, these are 
closely related to one another, but they're fundamentally different concepts, uh, which is something that you really uh, need to understand. So we have a big theorem that's super useful uh, that actually um, does establish a connection between these two things, and um, they are extremely, extremely closely related, so much so that um, right, we can, in some sense, use the division algorithm version uh, to make com computations a lot easier for any integers a and b we have that a is congruent to b mod m if and only if A mod M is equal to B mod M. And the proof of this theorem, since it's an if and only if statement, should go both directions. I'm going to do the forward direction here, and it'd be a good exercise to the opposite direction as well. So we'll start by assuming that A is congruent to B mod M, which means that M divides A minus B, which means that there exists an integer K. such that a minus b is equal to k times m. And uh, remember that we can divide both a and b by m individually as well. So uh, a is going to be equal to some quotient called qa times m plus ra where Ra is between 0 and strictly less than M. And B is going to be QB times M plus RB, where RB is also between 0 and strictly less than M. And if we then take both of these expressions for A and B and plug into this formula right here, we get QA minus QB times M plus RA minus RB must be equal to K times M. And uh, this is an interesting equation that we can work with um, specifically because of the following. So if we look at uh, the structure of this equation, um, I can subtract k times m from both sides to get qa minus qb minus k times m must be equal to rb minus ra. And that, what that means is that rb, the remainder of b, minus the remainder of a, uh, must be divisible by M. Specifically, this is equal to some L times M. But R, B, and R, A are both, uh, you know, integers from 0 to M minus 1, um, meaning that we can really, uh, uh, you know, kind of bound the set of possibilities for R, B, and R, A. Um, and sure enough, uh, the possibility that we care about, all of their possibilities will actually lead us to a contradiction, and it'd be a good thing to go through and verify to yourself. But um, we have that either L equals zero, so RB is equal to RA, or 
L is an integer that's strictly greater than zero, uh, the assumption of which will lead to contradiction. So uh, we conclude then that Rb must equal Ra, or uh, Ra is A mod M, and Rb is B mod M. And for that backwards part of the proof, I'm not going to go through step by step, but the idea is that by making this assumption, you can very clearly see how to work backwards um, to d directly show um, that uh, A minus B is, will always be uh, congruent to, uh, or A will always be congruent to B mod M, or A minus B will always be divisible by M. And so, in addition to this, uh, what we've actually kind of already shown in this proof uh, very directly is another theorem that uh, for A and B integers, an M positive integer, that integers A and B are congruent mod m if and only if there exists an integer p such that a is equal to b plus p times m because the integer p is exactly the integer k uh, from the existence and the definition of uh, congruence. So this idea is right, super important. And uh, we also can show by virtue of the previous relation shown for addition and multiplication that if a is congruent to b mod m and c is congruent to d mod m that a times c is congruent to b times d mod m and a plus c is congruent to b plus d mod m so the proof again is going to be to look at um, the assumption that A is congruent to B. We assume that M divides A minus B and M divides C minus D, which means that there exist integers S and T such that A minus B is equal to S times M and c minus d is equal to t times m. And really then, it's just a matter of taking these two expressions uh, and either um, in the first one multiplying them or in the second one uh, adding them in grouping terms to show that um, the resulting uh, statements are, are true. There's a little bit of work here to finish the proof. And it's at this point that I want to make a really important note about this previous theorem. This is not an if 
and only a statement. Which means that just because the multiplication of uh, two integers is congruent, it does not imply that uh, the original uh, uh, integers themselves are congruent. So for instance, if a times c is congruent to b times d mod m, this does not imply that a is congruent to b and a is congruent to c. Um, this is really, really, really important. And so I guess what I'm saying here is that if a times c is congruent to b times c mod m, then a may not be congruent to b, or a is congruent to b mod m may, and very often is, be a false statement. And uh, examples of this, or I should say counterexamples to the previous uh, if-then statement in reverse um, are numerous. Right? Take, for instance, 6 is congruent to 6 mod 3. 6 is 2 times 3. 6 is also 1 times 6. This is saying that 2 times 3 is congruent to 1 times 6 mod 3. However, um, we clearly have that 2 is not congruent to 1 mod 3. This is because 2 minus 1 is equal to 1, which is not equal to any integer k times 3. So be very, very careful that you're moving in the correct direction if you're going to use this theorem. And because of this, uh, in general, we also have that if um, a is congruent to b mod m and c is congruent to d mod m in general the congruence a to the power c b to the power d mod m is not true. Right, for this exact same uh, reason that uh, I just I just list um, now you might be able to find examples of it being true but in general it's not true. So you have to be very very careful. But from the previous work that we've done, we can now uh, show uh, corollary, which helps us compute uh, general mods of multiplications and additions. And this is the following, that um, A plus B mod M is in general going to be the same thing as The result of first doing a mod m plus b mod m and then doing mod m of the result. Uh, this is a computational simplification because uh, doing putting the remainder of a division by m and b division by m yields uh, numbers that are smaller or in the list from 0 to m minus 1. And then we can do the addition of those two integers and do the mod of uh, the result. And similarly, a times b 
multiply to m. Can always be computed by doing a mod m multiplying it by b mod m. And then taking the mod the remainder of uh, this result. Um, and this is a very, very nice, nice property because it allows us to, to capitalize on it and uh, do many sorts of uh, very fast algorithms. Specifically in the next lecture, we'll talk about what's called fast modular uh, exponentiation, uh, which capitalizes on this property right here. Um, the proof of uh, these two equations are relatively simple, and uh, I'm going to omit the proofs, but uh, you can find them in the book in chapter 4.1. And so for the final part of this lecture, what I want to talk about is uh, some of the algebraic structure, structure that's uh, inherent in the set ZM, um, or uh, that is you know, coming along with the set ZM. So you define the set ZM to be the set of integers modulo M, or a set of integers modulo the set m times z, and really this is set theoretically isomorphic to this. This is z mod the equivalence class in the uh, um, first example from the equivalence class uh, lecture. ZM is just the set of integers 0, 1, 2, all the way up to M minus 1. And on this set, we uh, can define two binary operations, uh, addition and multiplication. Um, addition mod M any A and B in ZM. Addition is defined as A plus B, where this is just going to be A plus B mod M. So it's the uh, remainder when you uh, divide A plus B uh, by M. We say that A times B mod M is integers A times B mod M. So again, the remainder uh, that you get when you uh, divide A times B by M. The operations of uh, addition and multiplication modulo M uh, satisfy uh, many of the same properties of ordinary addition and multiplication of integers. Um, in particular, they satisfy closure. So uh, for any two elements, A and B in ZM, A plus M, or A plus B, and A times B are also in ZM. They both satisfy associativity. For any A, B, and C in ZM, A plus B plus C is equivalent to A plus B plus C. 
mod m. This is associativity of addition. And we also have that a times b times c is going to be equal to a times b times c. We have commutativity for both of the operations, which means that a plus b mod m will always be equal to b plus a mod m. And we also have that a times b mod m will always be equal to b times a mod m. We have uh, the existence of uh, identity elements. both an additive identity and um, a multiplicative identity, um, specifically 0 and 1. So 0 is the additive identity because for any a in zm, a plus 0 is equal to a, and the integer of 1 Modulo multiplied by a, or a times 1 will always be equal to a itself. We always have the uh, existence of an additive inverse as well. However, uh, due to the um, uh, previous example shown, uh, we don't necessarily always have a multiplicative inverse. So uh, all we can say about inverses is that for every um, non-zero element in Zm, then The number m minus a is the additive inverse of a, which means that a plus m minus a will always be equal to the zero element. And the last property that we have here is what's called uh, multiplicative distributivity. Which is that uh, for any a, b, and c in z, m, we have that a Modular multiplication with B plus C is going to be equal to A modular multiplication with B plus A modular multiplication C. And likewise,
we have that uh, for any a, b, and c, a plus b mod m times c mod m is the same thing as a times c mod m plus b times c mod m. So uh, the idea here is that this uh, provides us with a very rich, what's called, algebraic structure uh, on, on this set. Um, and this is uh, you know, coming from what's called the topic of abstract algebra, or um, you know, essentially using um, these advanced mathematical ideas that we've had uh, to generalize concepts from, uh, from, from, from algebra. Um, and what I'm going to do for the very ending part of this lecture is go into a number of different definitions from abstract algebra of objects that are very, very, very important, uh, of which uh, this set um, of modular uh, arithmetic, or the set of integers mod m, uh, is an example, just one example of uh, a whole uh, variety of very, very important examples um, of mathematical objects that are studied uh, sort of in general in abstract algebra.